Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church this weekend. We're so glad that you're here. Would you stand up to your feet with us and let's worship Jesus together this morning? Come on, put your hands together. Let your life that I that I may live free, and by your blood, your sacrifice, now I am redeemed. You came, you came to the earth. Come on. It carried my sin, and now I will lift up your name with all that I am. Cause you paid, cause you paid it all, you paid it all, you paid it all. Oh, you paid it all, you paid it all, you paid it all. So I lift up your name. Across the earth I will see I crown you in praise Cause you paid it Thank you. 
church today. Honestly, I'm just glad to be out of the house after being cooped up for a couple days with all this crazy weather. We're so glad that you're here today at Milestone Church. If this is your first time here, we just want to just welcome you into this house. We hope that when you walked in, you just felt welcome here. You felt at home here. You know, we have a really cool opportunity this morning because we're here gathered together under the name of Jesus. And you know what? We all carry in burdens and issues, and maybe there's hurts and pains that you're walking through. Maybe there's financial struggles or relationships that that are, are walking through issues right now. But the truth is, when we come up underneath the presence of God in the name of Jesus, when we give those things to Him, when we cast our cares at His feet, on Him, we focus our attention on Jesus, and things begin to happen in His presence. He gives us perspective. He gives us kind of His eyes to see see our situations through his lens. So as we worship this morning, our heart is that you'd connect with a God who's real, who's here, whose presence is in this place. And he wants to connect with you this morning. Sometimes it's good to just, just stop for a second and stop thinking about all the things that are going on and just pause and go, okay, God, I just wanna, I wanna hear from you right now in this moment. I just encourage you to do that as we worship as we sing these songs to God. Jesus, we love you today, Lord. We thank you for who you are, God. Be magnified, be lifted high in this place, Jesus. Oh, Lord. Sing, you are good. You are good, you are good. There's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love display for all to see you are light you are light when the darkness closes in you are hope you are hope you have covered all my sins sins in faith you are peace you are peace when my fear is crippling you are true you are true in my wandering, you are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I see, you are life, you are life, your death has lost its sting, oh Lord. And oh, I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms, the riches of your will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world forever sing you are more come on you are more you are more than my words will ever say you are lord, you are lord. all creation will proclaim Sing no other name, 
Jesus, Jesus, my heart will sing no other name, Jesus, oh Jesus, my heart will sing, come on, just sing it over your life today, he's our hope today, he's our victory, in the name of Jesus, come on, lift it up, my heart. My heart will sing no other name, Jesus, oh Jesus.
Let's just sing this out together. Let's just lift up a hallelujah in this place. Let's praise the Lord for what he's done for us. Let's sing this out together. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb is overcome. We sing sacrifice that Jesus paid and we thank you for a moment like this where we gather together Lord and we just sing of who you are God and we speak of who you are and we remind ourselves I know for me sometimes I just need to remind myself of who you are and this is a moment together that we can just declare and remind and line up with the truth of who you are God we just thank you Lord that you transform our lives in, our, in your presence, God. We thank you that you change us through your word, God, that you literally, the, the Bible says that you wash our minds with your word. And God, I pray, God, that you would do that today. Lord, that you would change our perspective. God, we thank you for your heart for us, God. We thank you for Jesus. And God, we just magnify you in this place. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. I'm Kendall, and I just want to take a second to let you know about some things coming up for you and your family around here. Ladies, we're so excited about our spring semester of Flourish. Flourish is our monthly women's gathering and Bible study, and this semester we're continuing our series called Beautiful, where we're studying Proverbs 31 with our very own Brandy Little. We're digging deep into this life-giving proverb verse by verse. Our next gathering is coming up this Wednesday, March 4th. So bring your Bible, invite some friends, and join us right here in the main auditorium. Lunch is available for $7 and childcare is provided free of charge. Milestone Missions is excited to host our fourth annual Easter extravaganza on Friday, March 20th from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. We'll bless over 1,500 people in our community by giving them an Easter basket or gift card and an Easter meal for their family. Now we really need your help to make this a success. So we're accepting donations of Easter baskets and gift cards at the missions table in the atrium through next Sunday, March 8th. We also need about 250 volunteers to serve at the event. So if you'd like to sign up, head over to the missions table in the atrium after this service or visit the local missions page on our website. Thank you for reaching people and building lives in our local community this Easter. Milestone Stewardship Ministry is so excited to offer one of the most popular stewardship studies in the country, Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. This nine-week class combines large group video teaching and small group application and connection with others. Using the principles taught in the class will help you get out of debt, save, give, and set up a budget. Financial Peace University starts up in a few weeks on Tuesday, March 17th. For more information about anything you've heard today, connect with us online for quick updates on what's going on around here. Thanks again for being with us this weekend. 
Well, as Blake said earlier, we're so glad that you chose to come to Milestone Church today. And if you're a guest with us, I'd like to just draw your attention to the white communication card that's in the seat back in front of you. And if you would just fill that out for us so that we can just know that you are here, follow up with a little gift and tell you how you can get involved in Milestone Church at your own pace. Pastor Jeff's going to be with us in just a minute. But would you stand up to your feet, turn around, shake someone's hand and tell them you're glad to see me at Milestone this morning. I want to welcome you back to a journey that we've been on together as a church family, and we're here at the last value, maybe not the last message in the series, but we're at the last value, and for those of you just jumping in with us, it's called It's Worth It, and I want to say to all of you that have taken this journey how proud I am of you as a church family uh, for prioritizing what I believe to be. I'm going to show you another value today. Um, I believe to be patterns, uh, consistent things in the scripture that God prioritizes, but how proud I am that you have taken the time and energy uh, to uncover the treasure. That's the theme of the book that I wrote, It's Worth It. There's a treasure available, and uh, so many of you, we, you've bought more books than we expected. You actually read them. I hear reports of you reading them. It's one thing to buy a book and another thing to read it. Come on, somebody. But uh, anyway, so you're, you're engaging with it. That's what's exciting. More than the book. I told you I didn't write the book in necessarily a desire for authorship or uh, anything. I'm not looking for a different job. I love being a local church pastor, but I felt a burden over five years writing the book and then the release of it being this time in the life of Milestone. I felt a burden that we needed to reacquaint ourselves and we needed to get focused on the things that God's called us to be. And again, it's what I wanted for you. I wanted you to engage with these valuable treasures. Jesus talks about a treasure in a field. And you may not have ever analyzed it before, but you're making every decision in life, how you spend your time, your energy, what you give yourself to, your money, as we're going to talk a little bit about today. You're making it through a value grid. And if you deem it to be valuable, then you invest but if you don't see the value, then you withhold. And so Jesus says, this treasure called the kingdom, it's so valuable that you'll go all in. You'll, you'll just, you will give everything, buy this field, uncover the treasure. And so many of you have been uncovering the treasure, not just with the book, but a couple thousand of you in groups and then attending services. And I just want to say how proud I am of you. And I really believe God has strengthened us for our future. I really do. I believe he strengthened you for what he has prepared for you. And so I'd like us to finish strong this weekend with the last value, and the value is generosity. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Acts there in the New Testament, Acts 20, 35. Put your finger on 2 Corinthians 9, and I'm gonna touch on some other passages. The book of Malachi, I'm gonna look at some other places and show you some things about this great value called generosity. It is and does contain money, but it's even bigger than that. Generosity is a lifestyle. In fact, all these values, I hope you're seeing, they're intertwined. They connect together. And one reason that I included this value in the book, and it's one of our values here at Milestone, is because, again, all these values, if you really possess them, how many of you know you can't give something you don't really have? And if you have these other values, the Bible, mission, family, development, 
Development's all about being a generous person and caring about someone else's success. Do you see how they all, they all connect together? And so this week we talk about our ability when we have this treasure called the kingdom, we have the ability to begin to think about giving it away. And I want to say up front that I pastor, this church is a generous church. This has been a value since day one, and there's never been a year that goes by that I have not been as a pastor overwhelmed by the generosity of the people of Milestone. Growing in their financial giving, growing in their volunteer service, growing in their ability to impact their community. The number one thing I've done, I don't know how many now, I've done our Discovery 101 class, and I stand in the back, I, I don't leave, I'm the last person to leave. I shake every hand that wants to be shaked, kiss every baby, come on. I love people, so I enjoy it, meeting new people. I'm amazed all the time at all these awesome people, you know, and I, and I just shake hands, and most of the people say, when I showed up to that group, or I showed up on campus, I felt like these people wanted to give to me. They wanted to hug me. They wanted to say, how you doing? They, they were authentic in their expression. Friends, that's generosity. Generosity is a lifestyle that says, I care about you. And by the way, the happiest people I know on earth are people that live to give outside of themselves, that live their life to say, what can I give away to someone else? How can I show someone else how much God loves them today? And so I'm not today preaching on the things I'm preaching on because I'm trying not for our church to make budget. We're better than we've ever been. We're more, more impact than we've ever made. Last year we gave $805,000 to missions. How many of y'all are thankful for that number? And I'm proud of you for doing it. And we're believing to give a million dollars this year to missions. So when you hear me talk about these things today, I want something for you. I want you to see the patterns of the Bible that can impact your life. And so many of us out there, we care about our children. In our world today, we want our children. There's a, there has been a lack of transfer. One of the things about these values I've been telling you, there's transfer of these things. And so we care about our children. And we live in desperate times, friends, in regards to some of the things I'm saying that need to be transferred to the next generation as well in the area of generosity. Now, every one of these values, if you've seen, God wires us up because we're created in his image. We have a desire. There's an urge. There's, there's something in us that has an urge toward generosity, but there's some blocks. There's some things that, that, that begin to block it, but there's an urge. It's, it's a little bit in vogue in our culture today in, in a lot of ways, corporations and our younger generation, they care about social causes, and, and uh, all of those things are good. Um, we know that we don't want our kids to be entitled. We've got a lot of factors. We have a, a country that we live in that struggles with balancing the budget and is trillions of dollars in debt. We have factors in our own lives, as I said, that there hadn't been a transfer into the current generation on how to handle resources. And so uh, there's a lot about where we live culturally that affects this. I said in the book, though, that when it comes to these values, a lot of us have an aspirational value toward them. But when we actually look at how we live, we go, man, I don't know if I'm actually valuing that value. Aspirational values are what you say I would like to be. And in the area of generosity, I would say this, there's a lot of people who aspire much more toward generosity than they actually live it. How many of you know that it sounds real good to be generous, but when it comes right down to booking that time slot to give that time to that person or serving in that ministry or writing that check. We don't write a lot of them. Checks for all you young people. That's those things we used to use anyway. But like actually doing it, oh man, it gets real right there, doesn't it? And so let's talk about how in the Bible, it's more than just texting the Red Cross $15. It's more than just a social cause. In the Bible, generosity and the way God has called us to live takes us up even to a higher plane. I don't know about you, but even as I preach this weekend, I want to go to a higher plane of being a generous person. I want to grow every year in my ability to say, Lord, you have blessed me. I want to be a generous person person. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, 
And this is just for context, this is the Apostle Paul. A lot of people look at the Apostle Paul, you know, and he was the driver, the planner. He was correcting sometimes in here. I love this chapter because we see the pastoral heart of Paul. And he's headed to Jerusalem. He doesn't know if he's going to die. He doesn't know what awaits him. And he's in these final moments with this group of people that he's lived with. And he says, I've given you everything that I have. I haven't shrunk back from giving you the whole counsel of God. He's talking to them about protecting them against these other people who could come in and take advantage of them. And in these final moments where they're weeping and they're crying and it's a farewell and they think, we'll never see Paul again. I think that brings these words to significant measures when this is the final moment and we're weeping and we're crying and I may never see you again and I love you like my kids. He says in verse 35, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words, the Lord Jesus himself said, listen to these words, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Now, now though, that's counterintuitive. Now, some of you have been around church, you know, you've heard all the cliche phrases, you can't outgive God, it's more blessed to give than receive. But let's be honest. I mean, if we're not really being religious and trite, hold on a minute. If I give some of my time, then that's less time I have. If I give some of my money, hold on, wait a minute. That, how am I more blessed? I have less and so everything about the economy of God and the way your time works, the way your resources work, the way your life works, the way your friendships work. The Bible says, he who refreshes others, will he himself be refreshed? I meet people all the time, so I don't really have a lot of friends. You know how to have more than you know what to do with? Be a friend. Be a friend. Care about someone else and you'll look up one day and go, I don't know, I have all these people around me that love me. It's all about the principle of the way the Bible, every one of these values, you gotta see this. That's why it's covered up, it's a hidden treasure. You have to see it through the lens of the way God's world works, not how our natural world works, not necessarily what our grandfather told us and how did that really work for him, not necessarily like this person. It's through that biblical lens it is more blessed to give than receive. And then you begin to look at it and go, wow, God really knows what he's talking about. It is more blessed to give than receive. One of the stories I tell you in the book, and this is everything about as we start talking about generosity today, we're gonna dig in it like we have every week. One of the stories I wrote in the book, when I teach on giving and giving your life away, this is one of my favorite stories to tell. It goes back to when I was about 30 years old. I went on my first ski trip. 30 years old. I went with some people in the church, went with some of our staff and some people in the church, and we went to their to a church, a family in the church had a had a condo, and we went to the ski resort. I'd never been, bought me a bunch of nice looking stuff, you know, got me a little outfit. And the night before, I know y'all are surprised by this, but I was up in the loft and there were stairs that went down to the living room, and all my friends were sitting around having hot chocolate. And I leaned over the rail and said, Let me tell y'all what's gonna happen tomorrow. Come on now. How many of y'all know pride goes before the fall, literally? <laughs> and I just went down every step with the nice sound effects. Shh, shh, and they're up there laughing, you know, whatever. I'm like, hey, it's on tomorrow. I mean, I figure I've played ball, I'm semi-athletic. I mean, anyone can figure this out. And so we go to the slopes the next morning and I put on the boots. Man, those boots hurt. Man, this is painful. What are y'all doing with these boots, man? And how are you walking these now? I'm walking around in these boots and they get me over to this ski lift. I'd never been on one. I'd never even been in a pair of skis. All of a sudden, like happens to pastors sometimes, not just the group I was with, there were some younger guys in their 20s who were in the church who showed up and said, Pastor, what's up? I'm like, how'd you guys get here? They said, hey, man, that's awesome. So now... There's blood in the water. The sharks are circling. <laughs> I don't know what happens to people that do this to their pastor, but these young guys said, come on, pastor. I said, well, I've never done it before. Oh, it's going to be awesome, man. Come on. And so I put my toes in there and just snapped on these, these skis, and I just kind of slid over, and a chair hit me, boom, like this. My wife, who had skied for a long time, she's at the far end of the chair, man. She's going to just leave her husband in this point of distress, let me tell you. We get to the very, they took me to the top. I get to the top. When I came off that ski lift, let me tell you, six foot three, 200 something pounds. But anyway, 
I was a little bigger back then, maybe, but I just, like a helicopter, wiped out women, children, kids, handicapped people. <laughs> and I fell no less than I don't know how many, 40, 50 times. I was sweating. I was tired. I didn't know what. I would go backwards, flip around, fall in the snow, wreck, lose skis, walk up, get the skis. It was the most tormenting experience I've ever had in my life. Humbling, nonetheless. I was in so much pain and so tired, I thought about faking an injury, so one of those red things, I saw a guy go by bundled up on a sled, I thought, how do I get on one of those? <laughs> so I got to this point where I could see the bottom, my wife's down there, nice little ski bunny with her glasses and looking good, looking up the hill up there at me, and I just thought, man, I just gotta get to the bottom. So I just pointed them straight downhill, down there where my friends were. I'm flying by the time I get to the bottom. I have no idea how to stop. I just jumped sideways, crashed, wiped out, gloves, everything. There's all these people drinking hot chocolate, walking up and down. They're walking around. I'm just laying in the snow, man, just eating snow. Just man, I'm just like, oh, man, I'm ready to die. My wife, she comes over, nice little outfit comes over. You're embarrassing me. <laughs> Embarrassment? I'm on the threshold of hell right now. Are you joking me? Here's what I learned. Now, I, I, after that, you know, when you're not good at it, I told, them, I told them after we left the thing, I said, that's skiing stupid. Come on now. You know, I know that. Who does that, man? You know, it's like, <laughs> and my wife convinced me to take a lesson. Here's what I learned the next morning in my lesson. The way skiing works is you're scared going down the hill and you don't want to get going too fast. So your natural inclination is to lean back to protect, but by leaning back, you end up losing your leverage and your edge. And the first thing they teach you to do is make pizza with your skis and create pressure as you're going downhill. The way you get down the hill is lean into the hill, not away from the hill. And so the principle is the same with generosity. Everything in your mind will say, that preacher is crazy. Everything in your mind will say, I don't know, because is the word of God the word of God or not? Because there's a whole lot of other verses that don't just pertain to generosity that are crazy. But when you see you're looking down the hill into all your fears and can I really trust Jesus and you're looking down at the way to become more generous starting today Lean into the hill. Lean into the hill. And you know what does happen after it clicks? Because there's some of you here, what I'm talking about this weekend, it's clicked already in you. It's already clicked. You're like, he's telling the truth. Because why? You've been on the slopes. You've skied. You've been down the hill. You've made it to the bottom and went, wow, that was cool, man. That worked out. Because you know how to get your shins in the front of the boots. You know how to create pressure. You know how to turn. You know how, why? Because you've been down the hill, but there had to be a moment where it clicked. This Bible verse that I just read, it's more blessed to give than receive, does not make rational sense. But in God's economy, if you'll lean down that hill, you'll find yourself going, man, this is amazing. Let's dig in this value a little bit. You say, Jeff, help me with it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Generosity is all about faith. It's all about trusting God over your feelings. Trusting God over your fears. You say, Jeff, help me build that a little bit. Well, every week I've given you some things, three things about it. Number one, what makes generosity so valuable? Generosity is fundamental to God's nature. It's just fundamental to who God is. You never look more like God than when you're giving your life away, when you're giving resources away, when you're giving away. Why? Because at the core of God's being, the Bible tells us, again, famous verse, John 3, 16, he loved the world he gave, right? So fundamental in his totally complete self-sustained existence without any need for us, he said, you know what, I want to give to them. He gave Jesus before our response. He, he gave to us. He, the, the theological term, term is he's omnibenevolent. The word omni means all. So he's all good. You hear people say, God is good. God is good all the time. Well, that's true. He's completely good. And because he has so much goodness, he pours out his goodness on all people. Did you know, even if you're shaking your fist at God, if you're mad at God, there are people that hate God. 
They're still living under a shower of what's called his common grace and his goodness, and he's just pouring out his goodness. Look at this Bible verse right here. Don't be deceived. Why does the Bible need to tell us that? Because we think, I earned it, right? I earned it. Well, don't be deceived. You didn't earn it. God gave you the intellect. God gave you the ability. God gave you all of what it takes to produce. You, didn't, you, you did do the work, but he's the source. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above. It comes from where? Above. Coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. Coming down from where? Every good gift. Coming down from God to us. As I've worked with so many people, one of the blocks to living a generous life is defining who is the source. Who is the source? It's kind of like when you're a kid, or my, I was a kid, my dad said, hey, go, go water your mom's plants. And you take the water hose out and you run around the other side of the house and you run back around there and you say, I forgot to turn it on. And you turn the water on and you go back around the house and you're watering the plant and all of a sudden the water just dries up. You go back around the other side of the house and there's one of my, my sisters kinking the hose. She's got it laughing, right? How many of you know sometimes you find a little kink in that hose, you get a revelation of who's the source, the source is God. It's flowing out of heaven. It's flowing to you from him. And so every good thing in our life, the hug from one of our children, our health, a smile, a warm sunny day, a good great cup of coffee, a good conversation with a friend, all of that is coming from our good God. It's all his. And he's pouring it down on us. You have to solve that. Because if it's mine... How am I ever going to open my hands with something that's mine? But if he's the source, and by the way, he's unlimited in his source and ability. Okay, Lord, I'll pass it on. Number two, and I'm going to go a little deeper here, okay? Another thing I love about generosity and giving and giving ourselves away is generosity is a test of your heart. By the way, I didn't make that definition. Jesus said where your treasure is there your heart will be also. And by the way, one thing I love about generosity, and uh, God, again, he's pouring out his grace, and God's not always necessarily calculating by the same math that we always use, but I don't know if you're like me, but I like to know, am I growing, Lord? Not because I have to grow, because he's some uh, cruel, mean, dominating father. I just, Lord, I, I want to grow every year. I want to be more like you, and one thing about certain things we've talked about, you know, the Bible or mission or family, it's hard to quantify. It really is. It's like hard to quantify sometimes. We even do that as pastors because making disciples is our goal. And so a lot of times we're like, are people being discipled? And you find yourself struggling to go, people are dynamic and this stuff is a little bit elusive. Like, how do you get your handle on it? It's really challenging sometimes in our personal life or leading people like you. So one thing, though, I love about generosity is that there's quantifiable measurement to where your heart is regarding this issue. You, you, don't, you don't have any confusion about it. So you, you just have a bank ledger in one area ter in terms of your treasure, and, and you can always see, well, well, how am I growing in my generosity. It's a test of the heart. The first test of the heart is that we bring our first fruits, the tithe, to God. Look at this verse. This is a pattern all the way through. Leviticus 27 says that it's holy to the Lord. Matthew 23, 23, Jesus affirms it. Proverbs says, if you want to honor the Lord, well, I honor the Lord aspirationally, but if I want to honor the Lord actually then he says, I want you to bring your wealth. If you're going to honor me with it, I want you to bring the first fruits of all your crops. I want you to bring the first tenth to me. The fact is, generosity doesn't even start. The floor and basic level is tithing. The first fruits of your tithe, that's the floor. That's the beginning place because you don't give the tithe. You return the first fruits back to the Lord. Look what Malachi 3 actually says. It says, bring the whole tithe. Bring it all into the storehouse. Bring it into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. I don't know, really, that is, is a uncommon section of scripture 
where the Lord says, just test me. Bring me, because I know, again, remember, you got to lean down the hill. This is crazy. Ah! I don't know many places in the Bible here where God goes to that definitive lengths to say, just test me. Just test me. Why can I unapologetically tell you to bring the first fruits? Because my God is faithful to his word. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. He says, test me in this. Every week I've been trying to make this real for you. And so I want to show you actually two, two stories in this area, because we have a multi-generational church, and uh, I think all of us have different barriers at different stages. I first wanted to show you a young couple in our church starting out and all these needs, which could be barriers to us doing what God says. I want to show you them. Then I want to show you one more after I talk to you about a second area of the heart. Watch this first one with me. So we were about $50,000 in student loan debt and I was working two part-time jobs while I was trying to go to grad school and Steph was working a part-time job. We had two kids. Uh, we were trying to pay off debt, but at the same time we just felt like we couldn't get any traction because we weren't making enough money to really pay off any of those debts. We would sit down just to pay our bills. and. You know, we would add up everything in the bill column and we would add up everything in the income column and our bill column always outweighed what we were making our income. In our small group, we talked about you know, Malachi 3, 8 through 10 and just how God said, test me in this. It was a very hard concept for me to, for me to grasp and Jordan was like, look, it just says, it says, test me in this. He's like, so I think we should, I think we should try it and see, test, let's test him and see what happens. And so we, we started doing it, and we've been faithful ever since. We realized, wow, this is really important. You know, this is a big deal. And so we started tithing, and uh, it was on faith. We decided to make it a priority, though. And for us, it was just saying, okay, we, we understand that by, by giving you this tenth, we're putting our faith in you that you're going to provide everything we need. Yeah, there were definitely times when um, it made more sense on paper to to put all of our money towards our bills and um, you know or even once we started paying off our debt you know start looking at oh well that tithe money could help pay off our student loans but we just knew biblically it didn't make sense it, it made sense in the world's logic but biblically we were meant to give our first fruits to God and we we're putting God first by giving him the first of our money and we knew that if we were to be putting that extra money towards our, our student loans then we're we're showing that those things are more important than God and that's not the case. God's put us in in a great position now with my job where we actually have money that we can use towards paying off our loans. You know, when we got married, we started off with 12 student loans, which is a lot of student loans. And um, this July, we should have our last one paid off. Um, we have four left, and we should have our last student loan debt paid off in July. And by the end of the year, we're hoping that a car payment will be paid off as well, which is huge because um, our student loan debt really wasn't even supposed to be paid off until 2025. So just by being faithful, um, with our finances, we'll be paying off our student loans a decade early. So it just goes to show, you know, when you put your trust and your faith into God, that he's gonna bless you just 10 times over. Uh, it wasn't always an easy road. Uh, you know, there was a lot of times where we could have probably made our lives a lot easier by just taking that money and put it towards our bills or anything like that. But we, uh, we stayed faithful with it. We knew that this was what we were called to do and um, it's just, it's been a joy to be able to give and be provided for and, and see God's blessing in, in our lives.
want to say thank you to Jordan and Stephanie and so many others just like them that have come through our stewardship classes here at Milestone. See, every one of these values, we don't want them to be aspirational. We want to make sure we're creating a culture here to develop you, to grow you into each one of them. And uh, so many people like them that have grown in their understanding of stewardship. And, and I can say from personal experience, you know, as a young boy, I remember my first little bit of money. And I'm so thankful I grew up in a church that preached the Bible. And uh, I, I, I heard those words, and I had parents who reinforced it. And I remember my very first money starting to tithe and all the way through planting churches and selling everything and moving and how faithful God's been. He's true to his word, friends. And still to this day, there's no way. I'm, I'm going to lean down that hill. You say, Jeff, what do you do? Every, every single time I'm paid, I have an online. I automate our bills now, so I automate that first fruits uh, to God. And then if there's anything that I get in any other way, then I, our accounting team will tell you it's God's and I don't want to take anything from God. I, that's the first thing I do is come up here and turn that in. I'm teaching my kids that. My daughter made $60 babysitting this week and I had it in my hand. I said, now what are we going to do, honey? Well, dad, we're going to give $6. I said, okay, well, let me get it. I will go up there. I had to go in the accounting office. Y'all got any giving envelopes? They're like, yeah, we're the church. We got giving envelopes. All right, pastor. And I, I, I gave that. Why? Because I want her to live in the blessing and favor of God. I don't know if you've lived long enough. All you need is God's blessing and favor. You don't need a new job or a new opportunity or a new cert. You just need God to say, I'm going to bless them. I'm going to bless them. And so it's beyond even just tithing, by the way. It's a principle. And I was thinking this week and praying about it because I've worked with so many people. I've been a budget coach to people. I work with business guys. And I know that that fear grips us so strong and that trust is so hard. And I got to wonder, okay, well, first of all, we got to trust the word of God. We got to know he owns it all. But I got to thinking even this week, here's another block. I thought, what is something that I know about the word that so many people that don't live generous don't know? And I thought, you know, one of, there's another pattern in the Bible of, of this idea that we're also sowing and reaping. So when you, you take some time or you take some money and you give it into the kingdom, you're not just losing that, you're sowing that into the kingdom. Now, I know some of you are listening to me and I understand the imbalances, Truth is, in every one of these values, there's imbalances. And that's what's got people locked up, worried more about the imbalances or something they experienced in the past instead of obeying the word of God. There's imbalances over here where there's been manipulative talk, condemning guilt-ridden talk from the pulpit and people sitting back or improper handling of money and people have let that frame their ideas about God instead of the word of God. There's been also over here maybe a manipulative sort of concept and God's like a cosmic bellhop or a slot machine that we manipulate to get. Both are extremes. It's like I said last week, we're doing this because we love Jesus. Why do I do it? Because I love Jesus. I'm not under condemnation or guilt and I'm definitely not trying to manipulate the God who created me. I just love Jesus. And Jesus, I want to do this. I'm not going to let paper with presidents on it separate my heart from you. So this is not even complicated. This is one area where I can just say, okay, Jesus. But when I give it, I also understand this passage. This is just one passage. Look at this passage of sowing and reaping. It's powerful. Get this in. Because when you start realizing, I'm investing in the kingdom. I'm sowing into the kingdom. Remember this, and this is all talking about resources in 2 Corinthians 9. Paul tells them, I'm talking to you for your benefit. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. He supplies all our needs according to his riches and glory. And in the same way, he'll provide and he'll increase your resources. Some of the people say, I want to increase my resources. Well, he, you, he, he, is a, he wants conduits. Then produce a great harvest of generosity in you, because that's the goal. Not being defined by what we have or don't have, but being a harvest of generosity. Yes, you will be enriched in every way. And by the way, this isn't just money. The people I know that live generous, obey God, steward, give, when you do that, you look up and you go, I cannot believe how blessed I am. I can't, God just, I just... And that doesn't mean you don't have challenges. You just have the blessing of God in your life. It says, yes, you'll be enriched in every way. So why? So that you can always be generous. 
And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God, and so it produces worship in them as well. I want you to see this next story of a life lived with generosity before I pray for you. Watch this life of generosity. We weren't, we weren't tithers, we weren't givers. Uh, we were very much concerned with stuff for us and, and our possessions and our belongings. I think Karen and I were talking about it. We just said, we need to start tithing. And then at that time, we didn't have very much income and we had a negative net worth. I mean, we were broke, we were in bad shape. But I believe that God spoke to us and caught the vision that we need to start giving because that's biblical and that's what, if we're going to believe the word, if we're going to try to start walking with him, then we got to do what he asked us to do. It was after that that we discovered that maybe we did like to give. And so we began to be sensitive to people that had needs. Um, the truth is we had needs too, but um, I don't know, it just seemed like as long as we had our rent paid and our food on the table, then we were in a position maybe to help somebody that didn't have that. But from the time we started being faithful with actually God's money, not ours, and really understood that principle, we never wanted for anything. He always met our needs. It's like he was saying, I'm going to show you if you're you know, faithful to me and do what I've called you to do, then I'm going to be faithful to you. I remember one Sunday morning, and she said, I feel like the Lord just told me that we're supposed to give so-and-so $500. Well, really? I, okay. And so I knew that if the Lord said that, that you know, we, we need to do it. And then we found out later that this particular family was going through some really rough times with uh, medical bills and like I had no idea about that. I, I really think it's a matter of as you grow in your walk and you begin to learn about what's important to the Lord, like to see people the way he sees them. And like the song says, break my heart for what breaks yours, then that truly begins to happen in your life. I think it was September of 2013, we found out that I had stage four lung cancer. Uh, we immediately, you know, said, okay, we're gonna fight this thing. And then the word got out. And so the entire church has just come, <clears throat> rallied around us. If there's ever been a time when we want we were maybe in a in a bad place but we were slipping a little bit it seemed like somebody would either text me or call me or, or I'd run into them or something and so it's like I can't get down because I got all my, my friends just holding me up it makes you want to just do more for other people and and to be that encouragement that other people have been for us this last year and a half. Whatever we've done, it, it certainly has paid off 10 times, 100 times over these days with, with the, uh, the outpouring of love and support and prayer. And uh, so if I was to go back in time, I think I would try to even do more. We're trying to be obedient to God and what he called us to do. and. We like that he has placed in us a heart of generosity. As a result of that, we love being generous. How many of y'all love Ron and Karen Pease? If you, some of you may not know them, but uh, man, they're the real deal. Ron has inspired generosity in me so many times. And you know, 
I believe Ron has the gift of giving in the book of Romans. I, I believe he does, and there's several of you that may have that gift. And uh, yet a great church is not just made up of people who have the gift of giving, but as I've said throughout this series, it's, it's every one of us. And I'd like to inspire some of you right here in the very end to lean down the hill. You say, Jeff, what's the next step? Well, number three is generosity just doesn't wait. I mean, it just doesn't. At some point, you got to go, well, I'm not looking at my past. I'm not looking at this. I'm not defending where I am. I'm not going to let fear cripple me. I'm not going to let mistrust cripple me. At some point, you, you know, it's like Nike. You just, you say, Jeff, how do you, how do you get there? Well, you study it all day long. At some point, you just got to do it. You just got, okay, I'm, I'm just going to do it. And so every one of our values, we have said, how are we going to reinforce this? And how do we bring more of you into this culture of these things that we believe that God prioritizes? And so I have a card there in your seat. I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward. We're going to receive our tithes and offerings. If you're a guest, give us that communication card. But I'd like you to take that card out. Just wave it at me. These may be some ways. Uh, last weekend, we talked about development, and we got more responses than we ever have with people saying, I want to grow. Just tell me what to do. So those of you that turned those in, we're, we're excited about that. This week, we're talking about taking a step in the area of generosity, and so we want to help you. The first one is some of you, if you've never taken an extended period of time and said, the Lord said, test me. Maybe you want to take a six-month tithe challenge to say, the first check that I'm going to write Every single pay period, I'm going to make it a tithe to the Lord. And for six months, say, that I'm going to do it and see what God does. He, I'm leaning on what he said. Just test me. And so I want to ask you to do that. We're going to follow up with you just like we have in every area of the value. We're going to send you an email, send you some encouragement as you're walking it out. But maybe some of you would want to take that. Number two, we have been very diligent at helping people grow in how to handle resources. March 17th, we have another class coming up. Uh, it's well done. We have volunteers. There's a table in the foyer that you can sign up. But if you check this and give us your information, we'll help you get into this financial piece. And then maybe some of you want to take a step, maybe in an area God may speak to you in the area of generosity. I don't know what that is. I gave some suggestions, but I, I would love for all of us. I am, I am honored to pastor a generous church. And anyone who gets around Milestone says that's what it is, and we want to keep growing and moving forward in this value. Let's pray together. Father, thank you, first of all, for the greatest gift, the gift of Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, that's the first gift you need to receive, because you can't give what you don't have. Love and grace and mercy and generosity, all that flows out of Jesus. And so if you don't know him, you're not surrendered to him. I pray you would just say, Jesus, come into my life. Be my Jesus. I believe you died on the cross, rose from the dead. I receive you today. And if you prayed that prayer, you're saved. I'm going to ask you maybe to come forward at the end or let us know so we can help you start growing. But Lord, I pray for all of us within the sound of my voice that you would grow us in the area of generosity. Change our minds, Lord. Change it to the truth of your word that it's more blessed to give then receive. And may a person that encounters us see a person of gratitude, a person of outward focus, a person that is received abundantly from you, and a person that is generous. In Jesus' name, amen.
ahead and invite the ministry team to make your way down to the front. And I don't know about you, but I'm so grateful that we operate as a family. And when there's a, a struggle I'm walking through, I have people that come alongside me and pray for me, encourage me. And that's what these people are here to do this morning. If there's something that you need prayer for, anything, or if Pastor Jeff said something today that just you know, spark something in your heart that you just needed to talk about, or maybe you made a decision to follow Christ. I want to encourage you to come down and grab the hand of someone that can pray and encourage you along your journey. I want to invite you back next week as we continue. Um, we'll have a great weekend next weekend. Stay warm, stay safe. We'll see you back next week.